Thank you. Good evening, everyone. How are you guys doing tonight? Good. My name is Michelle, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and also uh, celebrating um, recovery from chemical dependency, and I'm an adult child of a dysfunctional family. Hi. I was like, ooh, I feel good, and then I get here, and I'm like, ooh, I'm nervous. So, but I'm so glad to see all of your beautiful faces, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, experience strength and hope. I have to start out by giving praise to my living hope, Jesus Christ. Please allow me to encourage you that this program is all God, his word, and how to get back on the path that he originally intended for us, one step at a time. I started here for good, more on that later, in 2013. Who I was when I walked in the door to who I am now, I just have to say hallelujah and all glory to God. So this is my heart's desire, less of me and more of you, Lord. Would you please pray with me? Father God, you are so beautiful, Lord, inside and out, and that you would choose us for your own is a great gift and honor. And uh, I just ask that you would just calm me and slow my heartbeat and let my words come out and let them be um, just filled with your spirit, that they would um, just touch someone in this room tonight, Lord God. I thank you, thank you, thank you, that you're not done with me yet. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I was born in Castor Valley, California, to Mitchell and Christine, and I was their miracle baby. My mom was told that she wasn't able to conceive and God had other plans. Psalm 139, one of my favorites, 13 and 14 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Let me first say that I do love my parents. With God, his grace, the tools of CR, and support from many of you, I've forgiven my parents. As a daughter of the king and an adult child of a dysfunctional family, I know that they gave me the best they could with what they were given and how they grew up. I was born into a family with addiction on both sides, uh, drug, alcohol, love, and relationship, and you name it, it was there. My parents were functioning addicts, alcohol and drugs for my dad, and primarily alcohol for my mom. Nine months after my birth, my brother was born. It would be my brother and I for about 10 years until our little brother and sister came along. Shortly after my sister was born, my parents divorced. We have some really great memories, and we also have some not so great memories of domestic violence, alcohol abuse, and witnessing infidelity in the, in the home, along with verbal and physical abuse to us kids. Growing up, we were raised Catholic, we made all of our sacraments, and we usually attended mass. I never had a relationship with God, but I knew that he was there. Romans 1.20 says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. We were raised with the do as I say, not as I do mentality. When I was seven years old, we moved to Patterson, California. This move was for my family to have a fresh start. Alcohol, drugs, and domestic violence followed us here as well. This is when the verbal and physical abuse to my brother and I would start. This abuse from my parents cultivated my codependency, low self-esteem, and my feelings of low self-worth. I thought if I could maybe clean the house or set up a dinner for my parents, maybe um, it would make things better. Sometimes the house cleaning worked and, ma and made them happy, and I was praised for what I had done, but not who I was as an individual. At the time, I thought this was normal. I would take this character defect into most of my adult life, and even today, if I'm finding, <clears throat> sorry, if I'm finding my worth in anything other than Jesus Christ, it could rear its ugly head. As a child, I found comfort in food, and my weight increased. This was great ammunition for the kids I went to school with to make fun of me. I was teased and bullied uh, starting back in the third grade all the way through high school. I was never taught how to forgive, so I stuffed. I always remember trying to exercise, not eat as much, or just binge and say, forget it. I was always comparing myself to someone else, and I was never happy in my own, uh, in my own body. Why did I get the blocky, stocky shape? My shape was obviously not an issue for my male cousins, and for a short time during family parties at my grandmother's house, my male cousins would kiss me in the bedroom. It started with one cousin, and then it was three of them. This caused me to feel shameful. I felt dirty, and I wanted to hide. As a kid, no one knew what happened. As an adult, I can see that the general, 
the generational sin of molest in the family was continuing. That generational sin ends with my family. At 15, my parents divorced and it was messy. Gone was the, um, well, I'm going to take a drink first, sorry. I know, I'm hot, Twyla. <laughs> I didn't mean to call you hot, I'm like, I'm really hot. But it was a really beautiful day today. Okay. <laughs> Gone, okay, so 15, my parents divorced, it was really bad, it was messy. And remember, I am the oldest. So gone was the hero child trying to get the best grades and obey my parents and keep the peace. Hello, freedom. Once during a party, I was getting drunk. Another party goer took this as, as an opportunity to take me on a walk. I was raped that night. The only person I told was my best friend at the time. I went back to her house and I tried to wash the dirty off of me. I couldn't get the water hot enough. My abuser would see me at school, laugh at me, and ask me if I wanted to do it again. I felt like I deserved it since I went on a walk with him. There was no forgiveness or healing, just more stuffing. After that incident, I was out of control. I had no help or guidance from my parents, so I dove deeper. My mom moved out, and I didn't have a relationship with her for many years after that. Her side of the family also abandoned me. Living with our dad, there were rules or a semblance of them. It was better than before. The promiscuity, alcohol, and drug abuse continued. As a kid, I loved cooking, and I wanted to be like Julia Child or Yang Can Cook. So I went to culinary school. And now you know how old I am. <laughs> um, the only school to offer a degree at that time was all the way in Providence, Rhode Island. Perfect. I couldn't get far enough away from my home life. I started college ready to make a fresh start. How much pain I could have saved myself if I knew the saying, wherever you go, there you are. Amen. <laughs> I tried counseling my freshman year of college and it seemed to help. I met a cool guy from New York who was really respectful of me. We became boyfriend and girlfriend immediately. I clung on to him. He liked me for me and I could do whatever I wanted. Basically wear the pants. Being the oldest and a person who lacked control all of her life, I loved it. We had our ups and downs, but we always seemed to make it work. We liked to party together and I even joined him in his addiction because I was the cool girlfriend. All the while, as we self-destructed, we isolated from everyone around us and ended up transferring to a campus in Charleston, South Carolina for a fresh start. It was a horrible experience for me. I had no other relationships except with my boyfriend. And as my insecurities grew, I grew in weight. Again, I looked to food for comfort. We ended up taking some time off that summer and I came back home to California and we kept in contact. And during that summer, my aunt, a new born again Christian, started talking to me about God and the Bible. I had never heard the gospel presented like that and I was scared. And I thought to myself, I really need God in my life. I'm fornicating and I don't know where I'll go when I, when I, when I die. My boyfriend and I got back together my senior year of college and I started telling him about God and said that we really needed to get to church. I graduated and we moved back to California. Within two months of being home, I dared him to marry me, and two weeks later, we were married. We found a house out in the city of Action and a Bible-based church called Big Valley Grace. It was here that we both accepted Christ as our Savior. Amen. God is good. It gets better. <laughs> we were baptized together, and we threw ourselves in the couple's ministry. Huge mistake. I was living a works-based faith. Finding my worth in the attaboys and the acceptance of others and not in my savior. We had heard about this new group called CR. We tried it out for a while. But I was still in denial, not being fully honest. And I thought to myself, I'm good. These people are really messed up. <laughs> <laughs> so we stopped coming. And we were fixed anyways. Our life went on and we had a baby. During my pregnancy, I developed a giant cell tumor on my right wrist. I had my first surgery when my son was four months old. The tumor came back four times and I had six surgeries on my wrist within four years. I was quickly hooked on pain pills. I developed high anxiety and I turned into an introvert. And if you know me, an introvert is not who God created me to be. Things were still good or so I thought, but at this point of being together for 11 years, I realized that I didn't really like being in charge anymore. But I still isolated and I asked no one for help. Four years later, our daughter was born, and we were arguing all the time. 
We were so disconnected physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I felt like we were having the same argument over and over. Can you say insanity? My husband was deep in his addiction, and I finally had enough. I was done trying. All the hurt, the stuffing, the isolation was coming to a head. The destructive issues that my parents had, the ones that I vowed that I would never repeat, I fell right into them. I thought this was uh, the answer. I was gonna leave, I was gonna have my own fresh start. And I was gonna do it right this time, but I was so deceived. I had walked away from God, from my family, and our friends. I got into skydiving, I love airplanes by the way. I was starting to feel like myself again, regaining confidence in myself, but doing it all wrong. I wanted a divorce, and I felt like we did everything we could. And why would God want me in an unhappy marriage anyway? I pursued a job as a flight attendant, our divorce was finalized, and we moved on. But not literally, because we were too poor. Plus, we were gonna be really good co-parents. While the job was awesome, the layovers are what killed me. If I had more than 12 hours in the city, I was drinking. My old friend Al was back. And at first, Al was really nice. And we got along fabulously. But the longer we hung out, Al turned on me, left me with anger and hurt to deal with. Michelle, the fun drunk, had turned into Michelle, the mean, sad, and crying drunk. The blackout, how did I make it through that drunk? And that Michelle stayed at work for the longest time. But then she came home with me, slowly at first. But before long, drunk Michelle was everywhere. Ruining family outings, events, and physically fighting with family members. Unfortunately, my kids saw things no kid should have to see. I hurt the people who loved me the most, and I put myself in danger. In July of 2013, my dad was admitted to the hospital. He was dying. All the years of partying and lack of self-care had caught up to him. He was 55. Praise God, my dad accepted Jesus a few years before this. We had my dad for 17 days, and on July 22nd, 2013, he went to be with the Lord. I was on duty that day, and I performed CPR on him, but it wasn't to be, and I was asking God why. I was still drinking while I was taking care of my, taking care of my dad, and definitely after he died to numb the pain of everything. And about two weeks after his funeral, <clears throat> I realized, you know what, I really need some help. My dad would tell me, Mija, I really worry about you. Or Michelle, get your stuff together. Uh, he was either really nice about it or mean about it. There was no in between. His voice rang in my head, and I realized that I couldn't let my dad's death be in vain. The cycle of addiction needed to stop with me. Losing my dad was my rock bottom. On August 12th, 2013, I checked myself into a 30-day outpatient for alcohol. I thought I would learn how to manage my drinking. And uh, now I know why my counselor chuckled when I shared that. <laughs> he said, I just want to do four drinks. <laughs> I was required to do two meetings a week, and well, back to CR I went. It had been many years since I had first attended. The first thing I noticed was that the people, you all, were so welcoming. Amen. I felt right at home this time. And now I could see myself in the messed up people from before. And you know who they are? It's me and it's you. We're taking those first steps out of denial, being real and wanting help, making changes. And not only was there a place for me, but for my kids to get the healing that they needed. I was coming out of the fog of the denial and I finally had clarity. I admitted step one quickly and reconciled my relationship with God. God had always been waiting for me. And after my 30-day program, I kept coming because I quickly realized this is something that I needed for life. I started and finished a step study. I never got past step four in my original study. This first complete step study was a chance for me to commit to get it all out. I couldn't run anymore, and I didn't want to run anymore. This was my true, fresh start. Amen. Where am I now? I like looking it up, but then I, I don't like losing my place. Um, going through the study in God's word helped me see that my worth is in Christ and Christ alone. The step study also reminded me that God never left me. His hand was always on me. Praise God. And it doesn't matter how many things I volunteer for, how much I do, whether at home or in public, my worth isn't based on my work. It's based on what God has done. He made me, and that alone is enough, especially since I'm made in his image, as are you. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Whew. 
I am forever thankful that God revealed his loving grace to me. I, on my own accord, do not deserve any of this. But I am so important to him that even if Jesus died for me alone, it would be worth it to him because I am worth it to him. As are you. I realize that his will is always better than mine. And it's amazing what happens when you're obedient and you surrender. Steps four and five, I really dragged my feet on those steps. Like folding laundry, and I hate folding laundry. <laughs> I'll fold all the laundry in the house. Um, but they were really the most freeing for me. Um, step eight, we made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. This step was hard for me. I had left many people hurt as I spiraled downward. But again, this is a step-by-step -step process. And when I arrived here at this step, I could truthfully write down these names. And with God's grace, timing, and the support of my sponsor, I was able to work step nine. And step nine is we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. I've made amends and continue living out my amends with my husband and my kids. And it's taken time for me to earn their trust back, but I have it, and I'm so thankful for a second chance with them all. I also, I've also made direct and indirect amends with many family members. The peace, freedom, and growth from making amends is so very powerful. The serenity prayer has also been very helpful for me and has kept me from having to do step nine as often. <laughs> I told my ex-husband what was going on and how I was turning my life around and the method. And through it all, I still loved this man. And deep down, I knew that if we both truly surrendered to God, God would be able to work through us. I prayed about it and talked with my ex, and he started coming to CR as well. It wasn't sugar and roses to start <laughs> by any means. We decided that we would date and we would do things the right way. And that meant no premarital sex. This helped me start the healing process on my self-worth and my past sexual trauma. We continued to come to CR and receive outside counseling. And I'm thankful to say that God has restored our marriage and we were remarried in September of 2014. Yeah. I tell him, I say, you're my favorite husband. <laughs> For us, the grass was never greener, and God originally put us together for a reason. My kids are amazing, and I am so grateful that they've had the opportunity to learn tools to successfully navigate life. Man, I love those kids, too. <laughs> At this point in my testimony, I'd like to add a disclaimer, especially for those of you who know me, and uh, Lord willing for the newcomer, we will know each other soon. On a Tuesday night, I've had people say to me, Michelle, you're so happy and joyful. Are you always like this? Ask my family. No. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, because Celebrate Recovery is safe, for me, it's home. It's the home that I rarely had growing up. It's safe and it's home because all of you make it that way for, for me and for everyone else. And in turn, I can be who God created me to be when I'm safe and I'm at home. The loving, welcoming, encouraging, and at times struggling servant. That's who God created me to be. Thankfully, God in his timing is still working on me. Since my first completed step study, I've been fortunate to complete an additional three. And am I done? Far from it. <laughs> Over the last 10 plus years in recovery, I've had highs and lows. And um, it's true, if you're not working on your recovery, you are working on your relapse. There were times when I was back to the old works, Michelle, and not because I was trying to earn favor. I truly love serving Jesus, but I didn't have good boundaries. Just because a task is good doesn't mean it's best for you. Again, this character defect didn't just affect me, but my family and those that I was serving. There's been times when I've isolated, stuffed, and tried to hide, and thanks be to God that those times don't last nearly as long as before. Now, I truly love step 10. We continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. It's very freeing and it's the right thing to do. When you wrong someone, take ownership. This step has also led me to realize that I need further healing and recovery. The ACDF group, the Adult Children of Dysfunctional Families, has been a huge help. Um, God is so patient and gentle, he continues to peel back the layers and I'm grateful for the resources and the freedom that we have here to do this work. Um, I'm thankful to say that I was able to read through the bed, 
the big red book with my forever sisters, which I'm really, I'm so proud of us. I wanna give us a little clap. That's a big book. It's at the bookstore. You wanna pick that up? <laughs> um, that is, a, it was amazing. And so I'm grateful for them and that we're just healing and growing together. And um, so when I started back in 2013, my first group was chemical dependency. And I'll tell you, slowly but surely, I worked my way through pretty much every single room in this program. <laughs> Um, gleaning and growing in each season. Step 12 has been an honor and a privilege, practicing these principles in all my affairs and giving back. The Lord has allowed me to serve him in some really fantastic ways. Coaching teams that our kids were on, here at youth ministry at our church. I love investing in our youth, encouraging them in the word, praying with them and for them. And where and when I'm able to, I share the tools that I've learned here. It's an honor to reach these young people with God's truth and positive affirmations and love. And it's all for God's glory and honor. Yes, they're so important, I love our youth. I've had the privilege to go on a few different mission trips, both locally and globally. And uh, praise the Lord, I had the opportunity to go to India last year to support and encourage our CR missionary and the servants that are working the 12 steps there. We have recently started up a prayer walk for Basong, so watch the slides. It's a really great way to support him in prayer and however else you want to, however else God is leading you to support um, CR India. Um, it's a joy and honor serving here at CR. In the past, I've been in a variety of different roles. Um, food team, greeter, bookstore, uh, on the leadership team, small group step study, and um, different, some other different areas. And so there's a place for you to serve here as well. Lots of different ways for you to get plugged in. And um, for, me, for me to succeed in recovery, I need all of you. Recovery has been a regular and Lord willing permanent part of our everyday life. It's been over 10 years since I started this journey. Over 10 years of sobriety, praise the Lord. And to see, yeah. Almost 11, maybe, but today is the only day I have, so over 10 years. Um, so to see uh, what God has restored in my life brings this verse to mind immediately. Um, I love it, Joel 2, 25. The Lord says, I will give you back what you lost to the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the cutting locust. It was I who sent this great destroying army against you. It's also been over 10 years since my dad went home to be with the Lord. And I don't ask God why anymore. I say, thank you, Lord, for knowing what was best. You moved mountains in my life with the death of my dad. Of course, I miss him every day, but I will see him again, and I'm confident he'll be proud of me. Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 says, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. To the newcomer, I'm thrilled that you're here. Congratulations on that victory. Just make the next right choice. Keep coming. Keep coming and praying for God to show you what he wants to do in you. He loves you, all of you, right where you are. Pray that God will give you the strength and the will to get here, and he will do it. Ask others to pray for you, too. Think of the paralytic man and the faith of his friends. Get involved in a step study. Meet some new people. And remember that sometimes people are just as nervous as you are, so just say hi. We're a family here, and we need each other. Unending thanks and praise to my God and Savior. To my beloved hu husband, Sean, I truly understand what in sickness and health means now. <laughs> I love you. Um, to my two wonderful gifts from God, thank you for your amazing grace with me. I love you. To my family and my sponsor, my stepsisters, and all of you, my forever family, I couldn't do this without you guys. Thank you, and thank you so much for listening. <laughs> Wow. Um, 
Michelle, I, you as an introvert doesn't make any sense in my head. <laughs> Your love for Jesus is quite evident. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Appreciate that. If her story touched your life in any way and you just want to be an encouragement to her or just want to have a chat with her, she's so approachable. So go and say hi to Michelle at any time tonight. Um, let, the focus question for tonight is how does making your amends help set you free? And so would you stand with me as we say this Serenity Prayer together? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, making as Jesus did, the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen.